this is a a, a, a war that's uh, illegitimate. Uh, it's an illegal war. It's a war that was based on, on lies, obviously from the beginning. Uh, we were told that there'd be weapons of mass destruction, uh, destruction and we all knew that, that there weren't. We all knew that was a pretext. We all uh, knew that there was no links to 9-11. We all knew that there was no links to Al-Qaeda. We all knew all of these things. And yet, these people that were in power, these war criminals that are still walking um, freely, are still calling the shots at some level. And uh, it's shocking to me to see that people like Bradley Manning and John Kiriakou are in jail, while people like George Bush and Rumsfeld and Cheney are walking around continuing their bullshit over and over and over again, even today on television. Uh, it's really quite disturbing to see how that works out. Uh, these, these talking heads that keep coming back again and again, having been so wrong for so long, uh, is just really quite shocking. Um, yesterday I was, I was watching uh, the MSNBC show and, and um, uh, what is his name, Dennis Ross is, is giving us his thoughts about Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now this jerk has been in that, in that field for over 25 years and has been just perpetuating this nonsense for all of these years and he continues to give nonsense to people and he gets airtime. What is that all about? It's really quite disturbing. Um, they asked me a question and they said, well, is Iraq better off today? And I would say very, very forcefully that Iraq is not better off today than it was 10 years ago. And that's a pretty damning statement because 10 years ago, Iraq was probably at its lowest point in modern history, in modern Iraqi history. This is a country that had gone through a few decades of dictatorship. It's a country that had gone through an eight-year war with Iran that just devastated it. It's a country that went through the Gulf War, and the Gulf War just decimated the infrastructure, and a country that went to 10 years of sanctions, the deadliest and worst sanctions of any population on Earth. For 10 years, people suffered every single day. We had to constantly send money to family because they couldn't survive. And these are people that are doctors and lawyers and people that are the middle class of Iraq. So when we went into this war, with, the, with I guess some people at some point thought maybe this might be a, a bitter pill to swallow, that things are gonna get better. Things did not get better. Many of us on this side know that war never makes things better. <laughs> and as, we, as we talk about sanctions, the sanctions are the equivalent of carpet bombing. They are there to destroy the population. The government doesn't get destroyed. The population gets destroyed whenever they sanction. So as these talking heads again get up and so casually say, well, no, we shouldn't attack Iran right now. We should just impose sanctions and strengthen them. My wife happens to be Iranian, and we have relatives in Iran as well. And they tell us what the sanctions do. They don't weaken the government. They only weaken the most vulnerable. Women, children, the poor. The middle class has been, in Iraq, for instance, has been completely decimated. Everyone has left who's able to leave. Really, everyone who's able to leave. I can tell you, of all my relatives, the only people that are still behind are the people that had no other choice. Either they had a medical practice maybe, that they had to stay back there, and they couldn't really find any other alternatives anywhere else, or they were too elderly to be able to leave. Those are the people that are still left behind. So the situation has only gotten worse. There are over three million internally displaced people. There's are people that have no <coughs> homes to go to, that have to live in shelters sometimes. Those are the most vulnerable again, people that don't have a roof over their head, that don't have any security, that don't have food, that don't have so resources and sources of, of things that make any human being live. People are not interested in democracy unless they have something to eat. You first have to give people the option to eat. Under Saddam Hussein, 
people had rations at least. There was food, there was some shelter. This is not an endorsement of Saddam Hussein because he was one of the reasons why my family had to move here. But it is still, when we say that things are worse off today than they were there, that's a pretty tall order and a pretty horrible thing to say. There are over a million people outside of, in the surrounding um, countryside of Iraq. Many of them are in Amman, Jordan. Many of them were in Syria. And now with the Syrian civil war, many of them have, have, have been even displaced one more time, staying in refugee camps. Again, being much, much more vulnerable and unable to get home because of the conditions that are there. Iraq has been divided and subdivided into, into thin, thin layers of ethnic and, um, and religious divisions that had never in the history of Iraq been there. And I'm saying never. Families intermarried constantly in, 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 in Iraq. We didn't know who was Shia and who was Sunni. We really did not. No one talked about it. It wasn't an issue. Many families were mixed, only to find out that later, during this last this war, that even families that are married between Sunni and Shia, they've had to split up because the Sunni husband can't stay with the Shia wife for fear that somebody is going to hurt the family. So he has to move back to his Sunni neighborhood, which never really existed but now has formed. Every area has become an enclave. And in fact, when I talked to my aunt, she said, you won't recognize the country. One of the reasons why I won't recognize it because every neighborhood has checkpoints and walls around it. People have to go through checkpoints to get to their home. And if you're not of a certain ethnicity, and the guy who's standing at the checkpoint is of a different ethnicity, you're in big trouble. One of our relatives said that he went to the checkpoint and he was Sunni. And the, the guy said to him, I know who you are, I know where, where you're from. He knew that he was Sunni. He said, uh, I won't let you in until you kiss my hand and kiss my shoes. So it's, it's that type of stuff, the constant humiliation that people have to go through, the constant struggle they have to go through just to get by on their day-to-day -day life. There's food now in Iraq, but food is very expensive. It's very hard for the average family to be able to buy food from the grocery stores in Iraq. But money is plentiful, except it's going to the people that are in power. It's like a gold rush. These people came into power. There's so much money. Iraq brings in $100 billion a year just in oil revenues alone and there's nothing to show for it. Today, there's still no electricity in Baghdad, a very <coughs> well-developed city. Everyone has a generator. When we talk to my aunt, you hear the whirring of the generators in the background. It's really quite disturbing to see it. There have been millions of dollars spent on projects, US projects, US sponsored projects, that end up just sitting half, half, half unfinished. One of the biggest um, sources of development now is building prisons. The prison system is abysmal. And a lot of the, the, um, the, the protests and the anxiety that has been created in the population is the abuses that are going on in, in the prison systems. Women being raped, uh, men being held without any, any kind of uh, uh, due process, uh, horrible conditions that, that were there under Saddam Hussein, and probably got worse. Because now they're just random. They're not even for political reasons or specific, but really just random things just to humiliate and upset a population. So the prognosis for Iraq does not look that hopeful, unfortunately. It's going to be a lot more years. And I was looking, uh, we we're actually thinking about doing this event that we're still in the process of honing and refining, but. Um, at the end of this month, um, we're, we're talking with Michael Moore, actually, to do some readings of the, uh, the pundits of what they said 10 years ago about the war.
Um, so it should be, if it's, if it's going to happen, you'll all know about it uh, right away. But we're talking about, I was reading something from David Brooks. Oh. They, I, I mean, if it wasn't so sad, it's funny. Really, just to hear what they say and the things they say. They've been running a lot of little clips from Cheney and from Bush about how this war was going to end so quickly, how it's going to be so cheap, how it's going to be so easy, how we're going to be liberated with, with candy and, and flowers and all of this. And none of it, none of it has come to, to fruition. None of that. <coughs> Iraq was going through dips and valleys. At the beginning, there was some, some changes happening, but they quickly slid very, very quickly back because the way we entered the war was wrong. The way we set ourselves up was wrong. And that's why you cannot create a ride by bringing in a wrong. It just, it, it just doesn't work that way. The process you use to get there has to be legitimate. Otherwise, you will never be able to maintain any kind of legitimacy, any kind of control, any kind of, of uh, credibility within the population. The population realizes that. They've seen the United States do this before in other parts of the country. They know the US is not there to liberate nothing. The only thing they want to liberate is oil. And even that, even that has been problematic because a lot of other countries have come in and taken over some of the oil. But it's really, I mean, it's, it's, you can sit there and guess and figure out why this happened. Of course, the answers are many. Um, and, 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 and much of it has to do with our complete, horrific, and obscene dependence on the war machine and how we have created an economy that is driven, driven by the war industry. And this is not just, you know, a, a, an idea that somebody is throwing out there, but I think it's been shown over and over again. This city, this city rolls because of the military. Almost every other person you run into on the street that's working, whether they're working in IT, whether they're working uh, at, a, uh, at a, 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 a real estate firm, whether they're working in a flower shop, it's whether they're running a restaurant, it's the military. It's the military presence in this country, in this city especially, that has created this false economy that we've become so dependent on. And I'm willing to give all this up if we were to, to let this go. If we were to go back to where we're supposed to be. And that is human beings who care about human things. Yeah. Not, not, not the idea of killing one another and and destroying every living thing we see. So I, um, so I feel I feel actually very hopeful being here today. Uh, it it just happens my birthday is March twenty first, um, <clears throat> and uh, I remember watching the invasion of Iraq um, the day before, and just watched it and said, "What a birthday! <laughs> what a what a horrible." horrible thing to see. But what's come out is, is people like you, people that I really didn't even think existed in this country. So thank you. Thank you.